Shabbat Shalom, everyone. I'm Rabbi David Levine, and this is Live from Home and Live from the Sanctuary. Shabbat Shalom. I'm Sandy Levine. Welcome. This morning is Yom Shabbat, Saturday, November 28th. It's the Shabbat after Thanksgiving, and we're going to continue with an attitude of Thanksgiving today. I want to welcome all of our Beth Israel Messianic Synagogue Mishpacha, everyone in the sanctuary. We're so glad you could join with us today. And everyone who's joining us by Facebook Live and all of our podcast listeners from around the world. If you're out of town or you're from another country, please use the comments to let us know where you are. And if this is your first time joining us, let us hear from you about how you heard about Live from Home and Live from the Sanctuary. We love to see your participation in the Facebook comment section. And right now is a great time to click the share button on this Facebook post and help spread the good news of Yeshua on Facebook. As we begin our worship, let's thank the Lord that we can be together on this Shabbat and enter into his rest and be refreshed. So from Sandy and me, we say Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Now let's welcome Cantor Aaron Jacobs, who will lead us in Hebrew prayers live from the sanctuary. And here we are live from the sanctuary. There I am up on the screen. Shabbat Shalom, everybody. And thank you all for coming together and worship with us and also those of you at home that are joining us by video teleconferencing, I guess, Facebook. Uh, thank you for joining us. With all of you and all of you at home, we are blessed by your presence as we worship our God together. Hopefully you had a great Thanksgiving and that you had a moment to reflect on the blessings that we have around us. So let us go ahead and start with the first of the formal blessings, the Bar Hu. Everybody is standing, so please join me. Bless the Lord, the Blessed One. Blessed is the Lord, the Blessed One, for all eternity. Barku er Adonai Hamborach. Baruch Adonai Hamborach. Le'olam Ba'ed. And we continue, as always, with the blessing of Messiah, where we thank God, contemplate, and thank God for the atoning sacrifice of Yeshua, which makes our salvation possible. Please join me. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us the way of salvation in Messiah Yeshua. Amen. Baruch Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher natan lanu ederech ha-Yeshua, Be'mashiach Yeshua, Amen. And we continue with the Vishamru. If anybody ever asks you why we gather today and keep this day holy, you can tell them it's Exodus 31, 16, and 17. This is why. So please repeat it with me. The children of Israel shall keep the Shabbat observing it throughout their generations as an everlasting covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord bade the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Shabbat to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, saith the Lord. Is 
we continue in our worship together with the Shema. If you all please face towards the east. As always, I will give you a moment to consider the words of Shema, the watchword of Israel. And please take to heart what it means, what we contemplate on. Taking action, doing God's will, considering the oneness of our God, being a participating member in our society. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Baruch Shem Kevod Malchut Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Blessed is the name of his glorious kingdom for all eternity. Ve'ahavta et Adonai Elohecha v'chol abaka v'chol nafshika v'chol me'odecha v'hayu Hadavrim ha'ele Asher anuchi Misfaka ha'yom Al-levavecha Veshinatam levanecha Vedibarta ha'bam Veshivtaka bevatecha Uvlaftaka vederesh Uvichashvika uvikumecha Ukshartam leot al-yedecha Ve'ahula totepo bena necha, uktatame mezozot betecha, uvisharecha. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And have these words which I command you this day be upon your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children. And speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you retire, and when you arise. And you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and let them be frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house, and upon your gates. As I always repeat, and as you know, that is the single most important commandment. It reflects and grows your personal relationship with our God. Yeshua gives us the second most important commandment because it demonstrates the importance of that relationship and how it fills our lives with all those around us. So please join me. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And we will continue with the Avot. Blessed are you, Lord our God, and God of our fathers, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob, the great, mighty, and awesome God, the Most High God, who bestows grace and creates all, and remembers the kindnesses of the fathers, and brings a Redeemer to their children's children, for his name's sake, with love. O King, Helper, Savior, and Shield, blessed are you, O Lord, Shield of Abraham. Baruch
And we continue with the very beautiful words of the Giborah. You alone, you, O Lord, are mighty forever. You raise the dead, you are mighty to save. You sustain the living with grace. Resurrect the dead with abundant mercy. Uphold the falling, heal the sick, set free those in bondage, and keep faith with those that sleep in the dust. Who is like you, master of mighty deeds? And who can compare to you, king, who causes death and restores life and makes salvation sprout? And you are faithful to resurrect the dead. Blessed are you, O Lord, who resurrects the dead. all be seated for a moment, please. You know, if you didn't hear, how many heard the service last night? Anybody? Quite a few? Well, it won't be exactly the same, or at least worded the same, but the message is a really good one, and for all those of you at home, it's a really good one. There's so many important nuances to it. He speaks of the ladder of Jacob, and in the scriptures this week, we read about the dust, Abraham's descendants being as dust to the world a blessing to the world. The ladder is interesting. As Rabbi David talks about it, what is the ladder? The angels didn't come down on alabaster wings. They climbed up and down a ladder. What is the ladder? It stretches through time. I'll leave that question with you. Are we the rungs of the ladder? Do we help angels in the spread of God's word on earth? Do we help that transition? both bringing word to the people around us through our actions and helping them find their way, their path to salvation. In the dust, it's interesting. I'm not going to take a lot of time. I just thought it was really interesting to get into the scriptures, and I hope you do. But as the rabbi talked last night, and it's really a great message, um, I was reminded of a couple of books that I really like. I thought of the dust, and I thought of his message, and it's about perspective. Dust is mentioned many times in the Bible. You can run through it, Genesis, Job, Ecclesiastes, Psalms, Isaiah, over and over again, Revelations. And when you take it, sometimes people think, oh, good thing, bad thing. But really, it's about perspective. So the analogy of dust, perspective. I like the three books of, uh, of wisdom, three of the books of wisdom. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job. Proverbs, when you get done reading uh, the verses this time for this week, maybe if you take a minute, just read a couple verses in Proverbs. Great stuff. Positive. It all works out. It's the way we want it to be. You do good things, good things happen. You pray, it happens. Do bad things, bad things happen. All makes sense. You get into Ecclesiastes. It's all an illusion. Good things don't always happen to those who are good. Prayers aren't always answered the way we think they should be answered. It's all dusk. Havel, smoke. 
You can't grasp it. You can't pull it in in your hands. So where are we left? Proverbs is true, obviously. Ecclesiastics is true. We come to Job. Perspective. Job's a good man. Good things happen. And then bad things happen. You know the story. But he doesn't give up. He doesn't abandon his ways. And eventually at the end, he screams at God, explain yourself. And God does, sort of. What he gives Job is perspective. And I think the rabbi's message today talks to that. The dust of the earth. We are Abraham's dust now on the earth. So how do we influence those? Inevitably, we get everywhere. So how do we influence, influence those with our presence? We'll now continue. That's just a short little, it's not really a Torah teaser, but I hope you get into the scriptures. It's really good, and I hope you really enjoy the message. I loved it. I'm looking forward to it again, and we'll continue with some music.
Him. You are holy, Lord. Thank you, Adonai. We bless your holy name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Rabbi Zanina, Rabbi Yuri, and the worship team. Hey, everybody in the sanctuary, let's thank the Lord for the worship ministry and everybody who's watching online. Let's give thanks to the Lord. What a great worship ministry. Rabbi Zanina, Rabbi Yuri, the whole team, we're just uh, so glad that you are a blessing to us that we can come together <clears throat> and worship the Lord. Well, this morning we have a Thanksgiving theme for our blessing today, that God would bless you with gratitude and thankfulness. And it's connected to Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 7, which says, Just as you have received Messiah Yeshua as Adonai, continue to walk in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. Overflowing with gratitude, overflowing with thankfulness. I just love that sentiment that our roots would grow deep and we would be built upon him and solidly established in the faith. And what would flow out of us is gratitude and thankfulness. And I love what Hebrews 20, 12, 28 says, since we're receiving a kingdom that is unshakable. That's important to remember. The kingdom we're receiving is unshakable. There will be shakings, but the kingdom is unshakable. Let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe. Lord, we pray your blessings on each each one of us, the children, the adults, everyone who's in the sanctuary, everyone who's watching on Facebook Live, everyone who will listen by podcast later, and those who will watch on YouTube as well. Lord, we pray that you would bless each one with, with steadfastness, that we would continue 
to walk in Messiah Yeshua, and that we would be solid and established in the faith as we've been taught, and that we would overflow with thankfulness. Let gratitude and thankfulness pour out of us like rivers, Lord, that have such a great effect on other people. Let it be, Lord, that we overflow, that we don't uh, just keep it inside, but we spread the gratitude and thankfulness that we have by telling other people and by telling you as well. Thank you, Lord, for blessing us. Thank you for giving a life, a life of blessing to us. In the name of Yeshua, we pray. Amen. Well, just an announcement about this coming week. Join us on Wednesday, December 2nd at 6.30 p.m. for a time of worship and prayer and the celebration of the Meal of Messiah. It's on our Mishpacha group page, and so you can find us there at 6.30 p.m. on Wednesday. When we give our tithes and our offerings, it is an act of worship. It's also a way that you and I can participate in God's incredible economy. Sometimes the economy around us isn't working right, but God's economy has special ways and principles about it. Proverbs 11.25 reveals some of those. Those who are generous will prosper. That's interesting. Those who hold tightly to our possessions, um, we don't prosper in the same way that those who are generous will prosper. That's why we want to be generous people. And those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. Sometimes the way God works in our lives is he wants to use us for the benefit of others, and then he takes care of us in very specific ways. When we're generous with our tithes and our offerings, we're expressing gratitude to the Lord for his care and his provision, and we capture his attention. And we want to say thank you to everyone at Beth Israel for your faithful giving. We're, we're grateful for your generosity and for your cheerfulness and also for your consistency. And thanks to everyone who's making special offerings above and beyond your tithes to cover the extra costs of disinfecting the synagogue and also the cost of JSO security. We really appreciate you standing with us shoulder to shoulder. If live from home, live from the sanctuary and Messianic Jewish teachings podcasts are a blessing to you, would you consider making an online donation today? You can go to our webpage, bethisraelnow.com slash giving for all the information about our online giving platforms, Giving Fire and PayPal are the two that we use. They're both very easy to set up. They're very safe and secure. And if you prefer to send checks, you'll find our mailing address. And if you also use bank bill pay services. You can find the information you need there. Also, for those of you who have uh, in your budget end of year giving, we would ask that you would consider including Beth Israel in your end of year giving. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your faithfulness and your commitment. To, it makes such a difference to all of us. Well, before we begin our Torah study this morning, let's pray together. Blessed are you, Lord, our God, King of the universe, who sanctifies us with his commands and commands us to engross ourselves in the words of Torah. Amen. Well, I'm going to ask a few questions for all of us to think about. Think about our answers and our experience. Have, have you ever prayed and you thought that you knew for sure what the answer was, and then it turned out to be quite different. Have you ever felt that you knew how a situation was going to turn out, and then, even though you were so certain, it turned out really differently? Have you ever had a first impression about a person, and then after you got to know them, you realized they were quite different? than that first impression. Well, I think most of us can say we've had some of these experiences and we can relate to them. And I want you to know you're not alone. You're in good company. In fact, this week's Torah portion teaches us that the patriarch Jacob, the father of the 12 tribes of Israel, had this kind of experience too. His perceptions were not always accurate. We're going to read a passage where Jacob's first impression was not right. It wasn't based on any real information. And once he got more information, he had to update his first impression. 
his second impression was much better and it was now accurate. So this morning's title is called Updating Our First Impressions. And, and I'm speaking to all of us because we're in such challenging circumstances right now. And I think many people are suffering. Some of you are suffering right now because you were absolutely certain that you understood how the election would go and it hasn't gone the way that you thought. And that may leave you disappointed. Or maybe you've been praying for someone to be healed and you were certain they were going to be healed. You were so confident, but then they weren't. Or maybe you had a sense about the COVID pandemic ending already, but it hasn't. Well, how do you process this? When you have this sense of how things are going to be and you're so confident and, and certain, you may even tell other people, you may even say, it's for sure gonna be this way. And then it turns out not to be exactly the way you thought. How do you process that? I wanna speak from the, the life of Jacob about this and introduce a starting point that when we find ourselves in such a situation that, that we realize that we did not know, in fact, how things were gonna turn out, I wanna encourage us to act with humility. And one of the ways that we can embrace that humility is to remember the teachings of the scriptures that, that you and I know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. And when we recognize that, then in humility, we can learn not to box God in. Sometimes people become so enthusiastic, for instance, when they're praying for another person who's sick and needs healing, that, that they declare that that person is completely healed. But it turns out they're not. And they've boxed God in and they boxed themselves in. It wasn't because they meant to do that. It's just because they stumbled in how they were praying. Well, if, if you did get it wrong and others are disappointed in God because of what you said, I wanna encourage you to be humble and to learn from the life of Jacob just to say something simple. I was wrong. I don't want you to suffer too much. If you're in that condition, the scriptures teach us how we can handle such situations. We can learn from the life of Jacob how to honestly update our first impressions. I'm not talking about the impressions we give other people, not the first impressions we give other people, but the first impressions we have about situations. One of the reasons I love the scriptures is that they present the simple and the unvarnished truth about life and human nature and the life of faith. And this week's Torah portion is such a great example of this. I wanna look at a really significant moment in the life of Jacob. It's in Genesis 28, and it shows us where Jacob's perceptions were not accurate. We wanna read from Genesis 28, verses 10 through 19. And I wanna encourage several of you to put that passage in the uh, comment section right now, Genesis 28, starting in verse 10 and going through 19. Jacob went out from Beersheba and he traveled toward Haran. He came to a certain place, this is verse 11, and he spent the night there because the sun had set. And Jacob took a stone from that place and he put it under his head and he lay down there to sleep. He dreamt that there before him was a ladder resting on the ground with its top reaching to heaven, and the angels of Adonai were going up and down on it. So let's pause for a moment and make sure we get these details right. Jacob is sleeping, and he has a dream. And what he sees in the dream is not through his eyes, it's a dream. And so his um, dream faculty, if you will, has been engaged. And in the dream, he sees a ladder that reaches up to the heavens. And God's angels are going up and down on this ladder. And so there are two important details here. There's a ladder that goes from earth to heaven. It connects earth and heaven, heaven and earth. That's the first detail. And the second detail is it's a two-way ladder with up and down directions that God's angels are using. That's important. Now let's get back to the text, verse 13. And then suddenly 
Adonai was standing there next to him. Now, you may want to check your Bible version because many English translations say that the Lord was standing above the ladder as if he's in the far heavens, the high heavens. But the Hebrew, I think, is actually describing the Lord standing next to Jacob. But at the same time, remember, this is still a dream. How do we know it's a dream? Well, verse 16 tells us when Jacob woke up, and he hasn't woken up at this point. So the appearance of the Lord is while Jacob is dreaming, but it's still filled with important details. The Lord is standing next to Jacob in the dream. So in the dream, Jacob knew it was the Lord, and he knew the Lord was standing next to him. The, the translations that say the Lord was standing at the top of the ladder, I, I don't think they're quite as accurate as they need to be. The Jewish Publication Society translation, especially the one from 1917, got the detail right. It says, and behold, the Lord stood beside him, beside Jacob, and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac. I think that's so profound because the translation of the Hebrew captures this important detail that God is standing there with Jacob. And then he speaks to Jacob and Jacob hears him and Jacob interacts with him. And the passage goes on. It says, the Lord said, I am Adonai, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you're lying, I will give to you and to your descendants. Your descendants will be as numerous as the grains of dust on the earth. You will expand to the west and to the east, to the north, and to the south. By you and your descendants, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Look, I am with you. I will guard you wherever you go, and I will bring you back into this land because I won't leave you until I have done what I have promised you. So in this dream, the Lord communicates as one who's standing right next to Jacob in important detail. God is not far off from Jacob. The Lord is close by. And the Lord is paying close attention to, and he says to Jacob, the land where you're lying. You see, he sees where Jacob is. This tells us something, that, that God is not just some philosopher's prime mover who created the universe and got it going and then took a step back and lets it just do things on its own. He's actually very personal. He's taking notice and he is close. He's seeing where Jacob is. And in the same way, he can see where you are. Verse 15 says, look, I'm with you. Look, I, I love that. Be observant. Take notice. Pay attention to this. Pay attention Jacob, I am with you. I won't leave you. It's a very personal revelation, and it carries incredible weight for Jacob. Jacob understands that this is a revelation from God. This is not his imagination. Even though he's dreaming, he's receiving a dream that is revelation from God. It's revelation from God, it's about God, it touches God's covenant, and it touches Jacob's participation in that covenant. And Jacob understands that this is the clear revelation of God to him, and it's meant to shape his view of God, of his own future, and of God's plans. And Jacob does not have any doubts about this being from the Lord. He's not questioning this. He realizes this is the way God is communicating to him. You see, God can speak through dreams. Now, you can also have pizza too late at night and have a dream because of that, or you can be worrying about something and, and your, your mental processes can be at work while you're sleeping, but that's not what's happening right here. This is a revelation from God. This is God's initiative, God's way of working, and this is a spiritual dream. Jacob has no doubts about this being from the Lord. So let's go back to the questions that I raised at the very beginning this morning. What did Jacob need to fix about his first impression? What was wrong about his first impression? That's what I want to focus on now, because that's what the next verse speaks to. It's in verse 16, and it says, Jacob awoke from his sleep, and he said, truly, 
Adonai is in this place, and I didn't know it. This is the moment when Jacob wakes up, and he's quite mindful of what's just happened in the dream. And here's his comment about his inaccurate perception, his wrong first impression. He says this, truly the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. Jacob's perception had not been accurate. His first impression was probably something like this. I'm out here all by myself. I'm in this place all alone, and I'm going to go to sleep in the dark. And when I wake up in the daytime, in the morning, I'll keep on my journey. But I'm out here all by myself. The reality was God was in this place. God was there. And Jacob did not even know it. Jacob had to update his first impression with new information. He fixed his wrong impression with the new information. You see, the new information came from the Lord. And with humility, let me underline that, with humility, Jacob did that. He fixed his wrong impression rather than stubbornly holding on to his earlier perception. Now Jacob could say, God is in this place. And I want you to pay attention to this. Jacob went to sleep in this place, but he didn't know anything special. It's not like he had some spiritual feeling or even a sense that the Lord was there, nothing of the sort. Jacob was not engaged spiritually at the moment. It's similar to Moses at the burning bush. Moses, if you remember the story, he saw the burning bush and it wasn't consumed. And it was curious to him. It was a strange sight. It made him curious. And he decided to approach purely because it was so strange and he was curious. He didn't have spiritual insight about anything at that moment. He didn't say, wow, a burning bush, this must be the Lord. No, Moses didn't even know the Lord was there. He didn't know it was a holy place. He was just curious. He didn't know the Lord was present. And that's why the Lord said to Moses when he came to that burning bush, he said, Moses, take off your shoes. This is holy ground. I imagine that was yet another shock. He was seeing this bush burning, and now he hears a voice coming from this burning bush, and it's the Lord? Whoa. Well, in the same way, Jacob doesn't know the Lord was present. Jacob proclaims, And we're supposed to take notice of what he says. He says, truly the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. That's, I think, a lesson for all of us. God can be present when you don't even know it. God can be with you when you have no spiritual sense about his presence. With all of your God-given intellect, with your God-given conscience, with your God-given spirit, you still may not know at all what God is doing at the time, and you may not even know he's right there. Well, Jacob faces that, and he deals with it with humility and with honesty. And it's the unvarnished truth. There's no spin. There's no PR for Jacob trying to make him look better. No, it's just the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And honestly, for me, it's so refreshing. Our politicians often spin the truth. So do people in business who are trying to market and sell goods, but not the scriptures. When believers wake up, like Jacob woke up, we may need to say about this time that we're living in, God is in this place and we didn't know it. Folks, things don't have to turn out the way you thought for God to be present and at work. God's doing his thing. Put that in the comment section. Uh, I want to encourage you just to, to write this. God is doing his thing, or God's doing his thing, exclamation point. God's doing his thing. Our prayer, Yeshua taught us, is to be not my will be done, but your will, Lord, be done in earth as it is in heaven. Jacob's first impression was wrong, but he updated that with the new information he got. His second impression was much better. And he was very simple. Oops, I got it wrong. God is at work. Verse 17 tells us, then Jacob became afraid 
And he said, this place is fearsome. It's awesome. This has to be the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. So Jacob is filled with awe. He, he's not filled with shame. He's saying, this place is awesome. It's the house of God. It's a gate of heaven. The God of heaven, the God of earth is right here. It's incredible. And I think that can become our response. Lord, this is an awesome time. This is an awesome situation we're in. Thank you, Lord, that you're King of Kings and you're Lord of Lords. We bow before you, Lord. We honor you. You are awesome, Lord. Folks, I want to encourage you, don't just hate this time that we're in. God's at work and he's doing something good. And how can I be so certain? How can I say that with such certainty? And I'll tell you why. Because with great confidence, I know this, God is always doing something good. The Lord says, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. The scripture teaches us God causes all things to work together for, for, you fill in the blank, for good, for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose, according to his highest goals and the ends that he has. He's doing more, folks, than we're asking or imagining. And so we need to update our perceptions to reflect that, just like Jacob did. Verse 18, back to the text, Jacob got up early in the morning. He took the stone he'd put under his head. He set it up as a standing stone, poured olive oil on its top. He named the place Bethel or Bethel, house of God, but the town originally had been called Luz. So Jacob memorializes the place by naming it Bethel, house of God, but he does one other thing. He takes this, this stone, it's a pillow, I mean, I don't know how you could even call it that, but what kind of man um, uses a stone for a pillow? Jacob did. He took that pillow and he turned it into a pillar. He stood it up vertically. He marked the place with that stone. It became a memorial stone. And then he anointed it with oil. And I was thinking about this, you know, the name Mashiach or Christ means the anointed one. And it's not just a sprinkling, it's the pouring out of oil. And so whenever we see something about oil being poured out, it connects us thematically with Messiah. And so there's a revelation of Messiah that's at birth here, and we'll read about it even more in next week's passage. But this memorial stone is not just a strange pillow. It's not just an odd situation. It's a way that Jacob changes the situation that he had been in permanently. He marks the place. He says, this is the house of God. The place had a name. It was Luz. Everybody else knew it that way. But for Jacob, it was now Bethel. And so it's a great lesson for us. God is at work even when at first we may not know that, we may not even perceive it, we may not fully perceive it. God is at work even when we may not perceive it at all. But just because you don't perceive the Lord at work doesn't mean he's not at work. He's the one who's trying to open our eyes and enlarge our perception. We're not trying to open his eyes. That's a really important lesson. God sees. He wants us to see. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 9 helps us understand um, how to see ourselves and how to see this limit that we have, this tendency we have to be incomplete and to get certain things incorrectly. 1 Corinthians 13, 9 says, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. Another translation, now our knowledge is partial and incomplete. And even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. Mishpacha, now we only know in part. We have limited perception and limited understanding. Now that causes frustration for some people because they want the world to be different than that. 
because they have the Holy Spirit, because they read the scriptures, because they know Yeshua, they want to think that their sense of what God is doing is perfect. But the scriptures teach us that we only know in part, we only understand in part, and with humility, we need to deal with the disappointments we have. Sometimes people pray and they're so certain because they had a feeling inside. They had like a spiritual sense of God's anointing on their prayer or his breakthrough where they felt for sure God was going to do something just the certain way. And so they prayed with boldness because they thought that's what you're supposed to do because people told them that's what you're supposed to do. They learned to pray that way. And then things didn't turn out the way they thought. That can cause great disappointment in people. It can cause people to, to become frustrated about prayer. It can cause people to be frustrated with the Lord. It can cause people even to pull back from the Lord, from the body of Messiah, from the life of faith. But the scripture teaches us not to give in to that kind of disappointment and not to um, enter into denial and to say, well, I know, I know, I know I heard the Lord when clearly we only heard in part or we didn't hear accurately or we thought we heard, but we were wrong. First Thessalonians chapter five, verse 21 puts it this way. Examine everything carefully. Test everything carefully with care and then hold fast to that which is good. You may have gotten some detail right, but not all the details. Examine carefully what you thought. Evaluate them. Evaluate even what you said, and then hold fast to that which is good, that part that was right. We're cautioned here not to fall in love with our own perceptions, even our own spiritual conclusions. Keep evaluating keep testing, stay humble, allow God to adjust and complete and correct. Sometimes I'll have a sense in prayer about how something's going to go, and I'll make a note about it, and it goes a completely different way. I sometimes like to keep score. In fact, I like to, to keep score, and, and I'll say, well, I got that wrong. And other times, I'll hear from the Lord, feel I hear from the Lord, and I'll get it right. And I like to see, am I getting more sharp in my perception? And I, am I becoming more aware? One of the ways that you sharpen your own perceptive abilities about God is to humbly correct yourself when you realize you didn't get something wrong. Maybe you got some part right, but not the whole thing. Maybe you didn't get any of it right, but you can still let your heart be humble. God will watch over his word to accomplish it, not our perception, but over his word. Jeremiah was a prophet of Israel who was called by God to be a prophet when he was very young. And, and his first perception is, no way this couldn't be. I can't do this. I'm too young. That was a wrong perception. His second perception is, it's beyond my capabilities, even if God is calling me. Even if I'm not too young, I can't really see what the Lord is trying to show me, and I can't hear what the Lord is trying to tell me. And then the Lord showed some things to Jeremiah and asked him what he saw. And in chapter 1, verse 12 of Jeremiah, it says, Then the Lord said to me, You've seen well, for I'm watching over my word to perform it. That's so interesting. The Lord's not watching over his word over Jeremiah's word, he's watching over his own word. So you may say some things sincerely, but be wrong. The Lord's not watching over that to perform it. The Lord's watching over his word to perform it. And you can test yourself. You can, you can ask yourself, if, if you become disappointed in the Lord, because you thought you knew for sure what the outcome of the election would be, then you can look for a good time to humble yourself before God. Some people would do that now. Some people would say, well, I'm going to wait a little while and see what happens. But I, I want to tell you this. All of us know in part. All of us see in part. That's our reality. And God uses this aspect of our human nature to build humility in us and to remind us that we 
are dependent on God and we need to depend on him. And so it's okay when you've prayed and, and then you realized you went too far or your perceptions weren't right or what you said was going to happen wasn't accurate. You can say, Lord, I thought it was going to be like this, but it's completely different than what I was so sure about. Or you can say, Lord, I thought you told me such and such. Lord, I lay this down before you. That's what we can ultimately do. And we can learn from Jacob's example. It's a paradigm for us to say, I thought it was this way. It turned out to be different. I didn't know. That leads to a prayer that I have for all of us. It's from Philippians chapter one, verses nine and 10. And Paul prayed this, and, and I wanna pray it too. He said, this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to test and prove what is best, and you may be pure and blameless for the day of Messiah. That's my prayer, that our love would abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that we can test and prove what is best and stay pure and blameless for the day of Messiah. None of us fully knows what's ahead. Let's stay humble and let's keep our eyes on the Lord because I can promise you this. If you keep your eyes on the Lord, it will fortify us in these challenging times. Well, I hope this encourages you. I hope this is practical for you. And I hope you can see how to apply this kind of humility and honesty in many different situations. If you get something wrong, you can say, I was wrong. Those may be hard words to say because of pride, but humility is the answer. And we can take an example from the patriarch Jacob, a real man of God who said, God is in this place, and I didn't know it. Let's embrace that kind of humility and that honesty. It will help us go a long way. Well, we're going to close with Aaron's blessing. But first, would you consider a generous contribution? You can go to our webpage, bethisraelnow.com slash giving for all the details. And now I want to invite Sandy to join with me and let's join the Corsians on the screen. They are at synagogue live from the sanctuary. So Rabbi Yuri and Rabbi Sanina and Sandy and me, we're all together. And we're just giving thanks to the Lord for his goodness to us on this Thanksgiving Shabbat. Rabbi Yuri, Rabbi Zanina, Shabbat Shalom. Happy Thanksgiving Shabbat weekend. Shalom. Thank you so much for leading us in worship. I hope you had a great Thanksgiving. Well, Rabbi Yuri, will you do the Hebrew and also Russian? And I'll do English for Aaron's blessing. Thank you, Rabbi Yuri. Yeah, let's pray together. Yivrecha Adonai Vishmerecha. Yair Adonai Panavalecha Vichunecha. Иса Дунай Панавелеха, Весе Веха Шалом. Да благослови Тебя, Господь, и сохрани Тебя. Да презрит на Тебя Господь светлым лицом Своим и помилуй Тебя. Да обратит Господь лицо Свое на Тебя и даст Тебе мир. Амин. И в английском, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep watch over you, guard and protect you, just as he promised Jacob. May the Lord cause the light of his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his face to you and give you his peace in the name of Yeshua, the Prince of Peace. Amen. Amen. So from Sandy and me and from the Corsians, from everyone at Beth Israel who's serving to help make Live From Home Live From the Sanctuary possible, we say thank you for joining us this morning and Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.